morning. I am uh, thrilled to be here, and when you're on a panel with someone from Google and someone who has uh, done this work with the Navy SEALs and with professional sports teams, you quickly realize you are the least interesting person uh, who will be talking to the group. Um, so I will keep my comments brief, and uh, as Matthew very helpfully said, um, my comments today are less focused on the research hat that I wear and more focused on the teaching hat that I wear, um, and in particular, the work that we're doing at Yale um, that we're very excited about on multiple fronts um, and what it is that it's teaching us about teams and what might be helpful um, that I can share with you. And so uh, if you look at uh, the, the view of teams, if you will, I think it's a bifurcated view. Um, there's lots of material, really good, some of it extremely compelling, um, that is based on anecdotal experience and intuition. Um, and I imagine, uh, like, like all of you, um, this, this is compelling, but it ought to make you a little bit nervous, right? Because uh, we really like data, right, in this room. And so one of the things that um, happens on the other side, beyond the anecdotal, um, is work that's based on systematic data collection on teams over time, um, working through a variety of contexts so that we can apply what it is that we learn from these insights to how it is that we enable people and train them to be ready to work on teams. Um, and that's very much the approach that we take um, at, the, uh, at Yale University. And so some of the organizing philosophy that I just want to get out of the way. So first is that teams matter. Um, we have come to see increasingly over time um, the extent to which organizations are um, happy to hand over larger and larger chunks of work to teams um, is, I think, uh, rather impressive and it's also quite scary because one of the things that we've learned is that um, the process and decision-making ability and uh, simply ability to gel as a team um, has an awful lot to do with what the output of that team is. And so organizations are in some sense putting into the hands of um, groups that may or may not be equipped to do the work as a team um, a lot of the outcomes that they depend on. The other thing that we assume is that designing and managing teams is hard that there's a lot of intuition in this, um, and for this reason, a lot of what we do is to set up our students to follow their intuition and see where it leads them astray. So that we then have, in some sense, an open audience um, to really uh, getting more insight into why it is that it's not necessarily an intuitive process, um, but that developing mastery is possible. That we can teach them what we know from thousands of research studies on teams, from data that we have from our institution, um, on the folks who have gone through, um, so that they can get better and better at this over time. Um, for this reason, and I'm, I'm very curious uh, to hear from my, uh, my mates on the panel on this, um, we go with very deep experiential plus lecture, as opposed to just conveying in an academic sense what it is that we know about teams. So we set up um, our teams of MBA students, students across the university, um, in failure experiences. Um, which we think is critical, actually, that they fail um, and fail in multiple ways that they would not necessarily have expected. It's safe to fail there, far safer than failing in your first job or your second job. Um, and the ability to be there to support them with insight, understanding, knowledge, and frameworks to get why exactly they failed so that they can move forward more successfully um, in the future is something that excites us a lot. Um, and this, again, rests on the idea that knowing is very different from doing, that they can cite chapter and verse how exactly a team works. If they're not able to be an effective member or a leader of a team, my take is that we really haven't gotten them anywhere at all. And so we start this with what I call a local build. Um, this is a, a bit of a walk before you run. This is setting up MBA students in um, co-located sort of small teams where we go through an intensive uh, bit of coursework with them um, where we're in some sense teaching them um, locally with teams kind of on a more basic level sitting around a table how do you deal with issues of trust decision making power and conflict and so on again running them through a number of exercises where they're failing regularly so that the focus can be on what is it that they're learning from that failure how can they um, not sort of blame each other or uh, feel badly about it, but think about what went wrong in our ability to, for example, understand what the task was that was before us so that going in in the next three hours to the next thing that we're doing, we can apply that and see how we move along a trajectory. And this culminates in the creation of a team contract where they realize what the principles are that they're going to need um, to work together. We've then kicked this up a notch to go global. And so something that we've heard from our alumni, um, from students who've come into the university, uh, and also, frankly, from recruiters, is that um, as teams become less and less co-located in that basic way, there is a global need, um, I would argue that it's a massive need, um, to figure out how do we equip people to work in global virtual teams. And so we've launched a new core course um, that looks at this to try to save the world from poorly equipped managers who perhaps were quite good at managing a co-located team, but where suddenly there are six members in six countries 
countries um, who will never meet each other, everything about trust, decision making, and so on becomes different. Um, and so to, uh, to help sort of those who uh, end up very frustrated by this, we see this as a real organizational opportunity times two, both at the managerial level around leading teams, but also frankly helping people understand how do you become an effective part of a global virtual team. Um, another way in which we do this is what I call sort of literally the build. Um, so the Yale Building Project is uh, a project that's uh, done at the School of Architecture at Yale. It's been happening since 1967. Um, and it's in the first year of the master's program. It's become sort of an institution um, at the university. And over the last handful of years, the team's faculty have gotten involved um, in this project. Because if you think about it, this is really quite uh, remarkable. This is six weeks of, of coming up with a full design all the way to models and so on with 55 architects split into eight teams. Um, it's one project, so there are uh, thousands of decisions that they make, lots of conflict, and an awful lot of process to work out. We start by training them in building literally a Lego man. Not, nothing as uh, complicated as you see up there. Um, but the thing that makes this project considerably interesting for us in terms of applying what it is that we've learned about building trust and creating effective process is that this is a winner-take-all project. At the end of those six weeks, um, heads of architectural firms and architectural critics come in, the groups present, they choose the winner, and then the students stay for the summer and build the project. Um, and so you end up with a situation where you have a building that's inhabited um, in the New Haven area um, by a family or by, uh, used by some other entity. Um, and so this has been another exciting way in which we've been able to try to apply what it is we know from the research literature on teams in actually equipping teams to do quite well. Um, and interestingly, one of the things that we've learned is in these teams kind of exercises where uh, we're trying to set them up to fail and so on, watching how it is the team deals with these, in some sense, stylized exercises gives us the ability to predict how well are they going to do with respect to their architectural scheme. Where will they end up with respect to the quality of the output um, of their product? Um, and so just to, just to quickly sort of end on this, um, some of the lessons that we've drawn. First, that you must guarantee failure. Um, in the team. If you don't, um, teams end up thinking that they're good, but rather they're just lucky. Uh, that you must also allow for experimentation and play in the teams. Without the ability to do this, people lock into a particular mode that will not serve them well because they don't have the flexibility they need as they move into their careers. Um, that groundwork and process feeds outcome. Um, and getting people to stop the rush to moving into the task and to take the time that they need to think about this um, will pay off. And finally, that success is not enough. That having a team that nails the outcome, that does well, that delights the client, that um, gets the project, whatever that may be, um, is nothing if you don't also have in that a team that has members who feel like they've grown and thrived from being in the team and who feel like they would want to go forward with this team because they could do it even better next time. Thank you. Um, I'm here today to talk about some work that we've been doing at Google actually for a couple of years on Teams. And uh, I would be remiss not to mention that this was a team project. And in fact, we have a couple of folks at Google who worked on this, including Abir Dubey, who directed the project, Angela King, who did a lot of the work. So all the hard questions go that way. All the compliments and praises come this way. Um, I actually want to start with uh, uh, a couple of years ago, when Adam Grant was very kind to come to a people operations offsite that we had in Disneyland. And as Adam likes to do, he did like a mic drop at the end of his presentation, which is he had spent some time at Google, and he had observed that almost every single thing that he had seen Googlers work on were done in teams. They were collaborating with each other. Very rarely did you see somebody in isolation working on a project. And he said, if you think about the, the services that HR is providing to Google and to Googlers, we're often orienting those services at the individual level. So we hire individual people, we don't hire teams. We assign individuals performance scores, we don't give a team a performance score. You get an individual compensation, not a group compensation. How would HR be different if we actually reoriented at least some of our services at the level of the team? And so within people analytics, we thought, well, what is the unique value that we, with all of our analytical expertise, all of our data could provide to teams? And one of the things that we came up with was, imagine this scenario. A manager or leader comes up to you, and says, I'm going to start a project or create a product. Here's my end goal. You tell me what kind of a team I need to actually achieve that. And we could say, well, given what you're, what you're um, trying to achieve, you're going to need five people to work on it. 
You're going to want to have one extrovert so that they can keep the team excited and motivated. You want two conscientious people to make sure details are attended to. You want a mix of tenures. You want three women and two men so you have that diversity represented. You want them co-located in the first six months, and then you wanted them, want them distributed in the next six months. And on top of that, we can take all of these profiles, and we can give, give to you a list of Google employees that meet each of the profiles. I call that the Pokemon approach to team staffing. We have a whole bunch of superpowers. All we have to do is find the right cards to slot into the team, and voila, an effective team. So we decided to go about doing our work and see whether we could get to that ideal state. And it turns out that teams are extraordinarily complex. We all think, we all know them when we see them. We're in teams. They seem rather simple. But you peel back uh, the nice veneer, and you see that teams have a long duration, various levels of interdependence, team members come and go. So in terms of our methodology for studying teams, we actually did hundreds of interviews of engineers, leaders. We followed 180 teams in both our engineering organization and in our sales organization. We surveyed every single members of those teams so we could learn as much about the individuals as we could and the dynamics between them. And then we had the mess of trying to determine what an effective team is. Let's just say there are many ideas about what effectiveness is. We had three different measures, and we analyzed all the data against those, those outcome measures. So at the end of this very long and complex exercise, were we able to get to the state that we had articulated in the beginning? Well, it turns out we can't, but I think we found something even more valuable out. And that is, very clearly we found that the dynamics within the team were so much more important than the characteristics of the people who are actually on the team. In fact, all the significant variance that was explained in our models came from dynamics. And so if you think about what that means for HR, the emphasis is a little bit less on staffing individual leaders' teams and a little bit more in providing teams with the insight about their own dynamics and how they're working with each other to allow them to be effective. So what are these dynamics? There were five of them, and these are actually in the order of the, from most important to least important or most variance explained to least variance explained. Number one was the sense of psychological safety. The teams that did the best are the ones where you could walk into that team and be safe to be vulnerable. You could contribute an idea that is completely different from everyone else's, and you will be considered, you will be supported, and there will be no denigration. Then there's dependability. Will your coworkers actually deliver what they're supposed to at the, when they're supposed to do it? Structure and clarity. How clearly are the roles defined on the team? And uh, how clear are your goals? Obviously, more tends to be better. If the team members feel a sense of meaning for their work and believe that the work that they're doing has impact for the organization and for the world, all of these things together help contribute to team effectiveness. I'm going to dive into two of the findings very quickly because they're super important. The first is psychological safety. Now, this is not a new concept that we uh, came up with. This has actually been researched for some time. Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School has done a lot of this research and has shown that it's valuable. It is especially valuable at Google and within Teams. Now, we had the luxury or the privilege, I guess, of studying some of our sales teams. And sales teams are great because they have an objective outcome that you can quantify, and that is a revenue attainment. Every sales team gets a revenue target based on the industry that they're supporting or the clients that they, they support. When we looked at those sales teams that had the highest level of psychological safety, on average, they outperformed their revenue target by 17%. Those that were the lowest in psych safety underperformed, on average, their revenue target by 19%. Now, you may be asking, is this correlation or causation? I think it's a great question. We considered how we could actually do a controlled experiment and decided it was somewhat unethical to randomly assign people to psychologically unsafe teams. And so <laughs> we're going to accept that with the body of literature that we have about psych safety and the persistence of these findings over time, that it's causational. Um, it, isn't, it isn't as simple as all of that. It's not that more is always better. I want to show you one interaction that we discovered, and that was the interaction between dependability and structure and clarity. It turns out that for the teams, that were very high in dependability, so you knew what you could rely on your team members to provide, the quality would be good, and they would deliver on time. Having a lot of structure in terms of the role definition and the clarity of the goals actually impeded that team's effectiveness. In contrast, the teams that had low levels of dependability, the structure and clarity actually helped a lot, so it sort of buttressed the lack of dependability. And you can think of this even as you have new teams that are forming where you're not quite sure what you can depend on people for yet, 
that's a case, that is a time when it's especially important to have roles clearly defined and, and goals articulated. So let me just end um, with an observation that we had, and that is, it is really important to study teams in context. A lot of what we know about what makes teams effective come from uh, rather sterile team environments. You have a group of undergraduates who didn't know each other before they stepped into a lab. They work together for two hours. They leave and there's no contingency. We do learn a lot from those teams, but it's actually good to do this research in the messiness of a live or organization. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Coleman Rue. As, uh, as uh, Matthew mentioned, I spent 13 years in the, in the SEAL teams after graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy. And so I've been a little bit all around the world in very much an experiential um, way. I, I'm pleased to say from Amy and uh, Brian's presentations, from my own experience, I wouldn't disagree with a single thing that they presented here. And I'm not going to bring any data necessarily because uh, some of it I still can't get from the special operations community. Uh, some of it I do have. I want to leave you guys with a couple of things that Dr. Kahneman brought up uh, yesterday that I'll add to. But I really want to try to give the group a little bit of a structure because I know clearly most people don't come from the same background. If you haven't spent time in special operations, you're not working from the same context. So uh, what I thought I would do is talk about a little bit about how our teams are organized and why. The second thing I'll talk about is our screening gates because they do happen over time, over a you know, in, in many cases a 20-year period, but really a lot of it happens in the first 10 years you spend in special operations. I want to talk about the problem type that we focus on and then some of the things that we select for later in a, in a, in a SEALs career. So the first thing is I just want everybody to give a sense of the size of a special operations platoon can be about 16 people. The size of a troop might be 35 uh, people. It could be upwards to 50. But I wanted everybody to just be mindful of the fact that when you're working with a special operations team, imagine that if your 35 closest workers, everything you did, Every training trip that you went on during the year, every client visit that you went on, every time that you deployed somewhere to do your job, you were sleeping together, sharing the same bathroom, in the field together. There's really no physical separation in that unit as it comes to when you apply your job. So we have to be mindful of you know, the, the factor of these teams grow together in a way that we don't normally do in, in the private sector. So that's a, that's a really important point. The other thing that's really important to be mindful of with the teams is the type of problem um, that we're going to be dealing with. And if you think about um, Snowden's research on the Kinefin model of simple and complicated and complex and chaotic problems, we're really in the complex and the chaotic realm of problems. And so our team training and education, the difference between training and education being for certainty and uncertainty, we really have to be mindful of that balance in our training when we take a young person who comes right off the street, so to speak, to join the military and what their life experiences are and then a commissioned officer who has, say, 10 or 12 years in, in special operations, and where are they in their career path? And I know that's always a consideration for any you know, business or job that we're in, but we're really dealing with the complex and the chaotic problem set, and very often not addressing specifically something that is just complicated or simple. So let me talk about a little bit about our, our selection structure. So there's a couple of different gates. One is the selection before you ever get placed into you know, Coronado for basic training, which is basic underwater demolition seal training. It's called BUDS. That's the first screening gate. You just have to get there in the first place. So that's one. The second one is when you're there at BUDS. It's six months long. You do things like Hell Week, and you spend, you know, a lot of different time learning weapons and demolitions and diving and various different things. And then you have a six-month advanced training program before you ever show up to a team. So you have a year. Your second training gate is really a year long. Your, your third gate is the first six to eight years that you spend in the SEAL teams where you're being, you know, essentially, you know, uh, you're, you're doing your job, but you're essentially being performance managed by your peers and your, and your seniors while you're spending time deploying and doing your job. The fourth gate is for those people in the SEAL teams, there's about 3,000 SEALs. The fourth gate is those folks in the SEAL teams who decide they want to go to our tier one unit. So we have a couple of different SEAL teams in Coronado and Virginia Beach, but we have one that does a very special mission set. And when you select to go to that unit, you're about the six or eight year mark and you're now going through another nine-month advanced training program. And Amy had the skydiving video. Um, that's a really good example. An example of what do you do in the regular teams and what do you do at this advanced unit is you may do your skydiving at 13,000 feet in the daytime. And at the six to eight-year mark, when you go to this advanced unit, you're joining teams that jump from 25,000 feet at night with no lights with 100 pounds of gear on their bodies. And so the job performance is very different, and that team dynamic really starts to become even closer, if you can imagine that being possible, 
than it was in your first team. And so there's, there's, there's another test gate there that's, that's really significant. And I wanted to close with that last test gate because we see more correlation to certain factors at the six to eight year mark do we do when we select somebody to come into basic training. And here's some of the factors that we select for and we see some correlation later, in career, later, uh, later on in their career when, when folks have been operating for quite some time. We look for and we can test for an aptitude and a demonstrated ability for stress inoculation. Can a person really do something extremely stressful, bounce back from that and do it again and again and again? Compartmentalization is probably a better term, but it really comes from a lot of uh, Dr. Dweck's research and, and the growth mindset is can you leave the last play behind and move on? Or are you attached to, I'm only smart when I do well? That's not really true for us. We have to be able to put the last play behind and move on. The third one is situational awareness. We know that most of human error is not due to uh, bad decision making. It's due to bad situational awareness and inputs and how to process those inputs. We still test for intelligence um, using lots of different measures. We test for emotional intelligence. We look for folks who are high velocity learners. The way we define it at that point in a person's career, um, uh, can, can, can you teach somebody something one time and can they repeat it? And what we try to say is, look, when you come here to this unit, it's a see one, do one mentality. We're gonna show you once and you have to do it or you're just not gonna fit here. Do, does the person have a bias to action? We really look for that paralysis by analysis. We're gonna analyze lots of different complicated situations, but we don't want people analyzing a complex situation. We want them to have a bias to action so they can generate some emergence in this problem set that they can then solve the next problem. Is the person aggressive? Are they operationally patient? And finally, do they have a tendency to this mindset of team, teammate, self? And you can watch people's actions and really judge that. When you're cleaning up dive gear, for example, and someone's brand new to the SEAL teams, do they clean their own gear before they clean team gear or before they help their buddies clean their buddies' gear? And this really manifests in a lot of different ways for us. And these are real factors that we observe and we judge folks on when they, when they join the SEAL teams. That's it. Thanks very much. So thank you, everybody, for what you were talking about. Um, one of the questions that came in, which um, I thought was interesting, is you, know, you talked about, Brian, at Google, really you didn't. Um, what you found most important was around team dynamics. But certainly, a lot of research on teams and a lot of the big questions on teams is composition. Mm -hmm. Big question about diversity, right? Mm -hmm. So people, you know, Different view, well, different findings around you know, diversity. Maybe it makes teams more creative. Maybe it increases conflict. Have you seen any of that? Are you gaining insights? And I'd also be interested to hear from Amy and Coleman from their perspectives. But maybe if Brian, if you want to yeah, kick off. Um, so that research has been replicated in a lot of different contexts. And so I, I definitely think diversity is important. Um, the one thing to note about this finding from our research that dynamics matter more than individual characteristics is that you have to keep in mind that we've already selected on a number of characteristics, so we had restricted variants and things that might be more variable in the studies that you see. So for example, we, have, we try very hard to have a certain amount of diversity represented on the team, um, and so that was probably a constant across a lot of our work. Similarly, we found that team size doesn't matter. It's possible that we're just really good at sizing out a team, so we never had the wrong size of team, teams. And that is why it's important to do this kind of research across settings so you can pick up on different things. So that is uh, one of the caveats. Another thing that we did find, however, is that gender diverse teams where we did have sufficient variability, we found that in high psych safety environments that gender diversity actually was a benefit to team effectiveness. And so again, there's this interaction like, uh, you can have diversity, but if you don't have a psychologically safe environment, you're not going to maximize on that benefit because the diverse perspective you might have, you don't feel safe to express. Coleman, did any experiences diversity and how that impacts team performance? Yeah, Matthew, at the, at the larger organization level, as Brian was talking, I was thinking, we're, we're abysmally non-diverse at the small unit level. Um, for a lot of different reasons, you know, whether good or bad, which we won't, we won't cover here, obviously. But um, in the larger special operations community um, for, for mission tasking and mission organization, we, it really looks like a Star Wars bar um, when, you, when you go overseas. There's tons of different folks, you know, blue mohawks and, and all sorts of different things in our larger intelligence community inside these joint operations centers. 
and they're massively more effective in, you know, you could write a laundry list of why they're more effective, but um, they're, they're so much better than the non-diverse teams at the larger organization level. So you go, and Amy, is this something you've played with your global virtual teams and your architects? So we, uh, we have played with it a bit. I mean, to, to Brian's point, um, by sort of selection into uh, the programs and so on, that we've, we're maximizing uh, all kinds of diversity. But one of the things that we've, we've done with some success is to try to teach students to understand what is the task that is before you, and is this a task where leveraging the heterogeneity in the group of perspective of experience and so on will help you, or will it hurt you based on what it is that you need to produce so that they're in a position to be perhaps more sophisticated about how it is that they learn to apply the research out there on when diversity can hurt you and when diversity can help. Excellent. So a couple of questions have come in as well about this idea of team dynamics being key. So, so we buy psychological safety very important. What advice do you actually give to leaders around that. And similarly, another question, related question for Coleman around, you know, what can leaders do with a team that's struggling? So in terms of reshaping the team dynamics, what are some of the core insights, tools, and so on that you find work? Uh, one of the most important things that we have found is that you have to give people insight in their dynamics and the data to talk about it. And so the team created a diagnostic, uh, which any team can take. It's important that not only the lead of the team initiates the distribution of that diagnostic across the team, team members ought to be able to say, hey, I think we want to learn about ourselves right now. And there are actual measures out there on psych safety. If every member of the team takes this diagnostic, they actually get a report on their team so they can see across all the dimensions that I listed before how they are scoring as a team. And that is the beginning of the conversation. So I would say that is the most important place to start um, you won't jump to any of the interventions or anything until, you're, uh, until you realize that you have an issue to deal with. And what about just, turning around teams? Yeah, I'll just uh, add quickly, Matthew and Brian and I were discussing this last night. One of the things that we spend a lot of time ensuring uh, leaders and teams understand is our critical incident debriefing and af after action review processes. They are brutally honest. They're not for everybody the first couple times you do it but they really flatten the organization and they're rank agnostic and the benefit, if it's psychologically safe for the team to do that, is really, I don't, I don't know how you would quantify it, but you just see such a tremendous difference in the team's performance. So one other question, so there was this discussion, I think, of kind of context. I mean, you've mentioned we have teams, Google, we spend a lot of time wondering about who to select, we have a lot of, spend a lot of time thinking about um, how we shape them. Similarly, the Navy SEALs, I understand, you're not just pulling people in off the street to go into those teams, right? So I'm wondering, like, as you, what should we think about taking insights from these? And this kind of gets, I think, to the heart of a lot of what we're doing with people analytics is, to what extent are we just taking off-the-shelf best practices from other organizations versus is it really critical that we do the tests and the analysis in our own organizations to see what works for us? Do you have any thoughts on that kind of generalizability, applicability? So, Amy, you've worked with a lot of organizations and probably have seen the variability even in things that we study, so yeah, I'll we'll pass it to you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Brian, <laughs> for that. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, around the, the question of what's, what's applicable sort of to various contexts that, uh, you know, what we've seen, all of these opportunities, you know, whether we have our students on global virtual teams with MBA students from other universities where they're in the core together and they're, they, you know, it's, it's not uh, the same as a military context, but their grades sort of, you know, live or die by whether or not they can leverage the team and make it work, um, that we find that there are certain, there are things that vary across context, but I just want to go back to this point that's come out in all of our um, talks, that setting up a good dynamic from the beginning, where the, t where the team is safe, where people can talk, where you can intervene, and it's safe to do that, um, and we do our own very nerdy the academic version of after action reviews where we'll videotape the team in action and make them watch it uh, to deconstruct what it is that's happening, that that does carry across, I would argue, most any context. And for us, um, a lot of times our engineers think they have absolutely nothing in common with our salespeople, and the cultures in the two parts of Google are actually quite different. Like you notice when you're in an engineering versus a sales group. Um, we studied both engineering and sales teams, and all of the dynamics that uh, we found were true in, in both of them. So 
And we find this not just on Teams research, but a surprising number of the, the projects we do in analytics, the consistencies across Google, despite the microcultures or microclimates, um, persist across. So I think on the dynamic side, context matters maybe a little bit less, probably a little bit more on what individual characteristics are required to carry out a particular task. Amy's exactly right, Matthew. I mean, one of the things we see is you get a tremendous benefit from a team that has someone who's been on the team for 15 years and, and they bring on a new person and that new person essentially gets a pre-pre-brief. They understand permissions and expectations and how things are gonna go so it's not such a shock when you join this new culture that you know you feel uncomfortable and so there's a lot to be said for um, permissions and expectations about what how these teams are gonna operate and you give them sort of a framework of that culture and, and people really, really, I think, overperform on what sometimes people expect. Wonderful. Well, I have a long list of fascinating questions on the iPad, but there are all sorts of interesting colors being flashed at me from the sign down here. So I think we're probably done. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for all of your insights.